So, yeah. I'm really, really feeling very privileged now to, yeah. to be with you, talking to you right now, Michael, because I, and it came out of a moment where I got your book almost as the moment you came over yeah. to start to publicise it and uh, read it like a shot, wanted to reread it immediately, yeah. and, and I kind of loved it. It was connect, really connected with it. And I'll do a little bit with, well, as my grandf great grandfather would have done, which is to. Uh, Start at the end because the piece okay. that really, really inspired me yeah. was the last chapters about enlightenment and, and how to live your life differently. Yeah, and that's a piece that I've not, I personally hadn't heard from anybody mm. else. So maybe you'd like to just, is that the space where miracles happen? Well, it for me, the space where miracles happen is what people start to discover when their thinking gets quieter. When they, when they start to look in the direction of, of, of these principles that I talk about in the book. Uh -huh. And it's almost everybody at some point falls into that space. And, and in the principles community we call it mind. Um, but it, but it's, it's, you could think of it as the state of meditation. But it's a natural space. It's not a, I'm going to get into this space and I'm going to get, you, you know, it's not, it's, you fall into it because it's actually home. It's your nature. Okay. Um, now, out of that space, it's possible to take a fresh look at life. And so the, the later chapters, sort of, I, I, I think of the book as being in three parts. Yes. I think it is literally in three parts, actually. Yes. But, but, I, but I think of it as being in three parts, where the first part is the, the foundation. Yep. It's the understanding of the principles and, and, and how our experience gets created. Mm -hmm. The middle part is sort of looking at, well, what are the implications of that for how we make sense of the world? And, and it talks a lot about wisdom and insight and grace. And then, and then the third part is, what are the implications of that for how we might go live our lives? Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that you probably haven't seen the third part before is it's just my thoughts. It's, it's not, you know, and I always think it's important to say, it's not, if you know these three principles, you will live like this. It's just... It's occurred to me, given what I understand about how life works, it makes a lot more sense to me to live like this. Oh. Um, and, and I kind of hope I do a reasonable job of kind of making it non-prescriptive, where people don't think, oh, okay, so I've got to do this, and I shouldn't do this. And I, you know, for me, this is a description of how life works. And then it's just an exploration of, of, of what that might suggest for what's possible, um, which is a lot more than people think. Yeah, no, I think that piece, is it something you said about, um, a sentence that really struck me mm. was, uh, it's, it's not the absence of thought, it's the presence of mind. Yeah. And I really love that because I've been um, understanding the principles now for a little while. Yeah. And you do tend to get focused on no thinking, less thinking. Yeah, yeah, thought becomes sort of this bad guy. And, and you're trying to conquer thought, like meditation or, you know, and that, or, that or, even, or even just, yeah. once I've got rid of this thinking, I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it is, it's just become stress reduction 101 then. It's not really at that level that different to a lot of other things. Mm. It's, it's when what comes into that space, you know, the, the presence of mind, that, that energy and intelligence that we experience as wisdom and insight, that and well-being. I mean, that that's what makes this so exciting and, and, and so different. And I understand when people read it, there are people, I, I love how many people have the experience you've had. Great. And, and you know, people, you know, they're on their third reading, their fourth reading, and for me, that's exciting. I understand the people who go, that's it? You know, because at first glance, it sounds like a bunch of other things. Oh yeah, meditation's good. Oh yeah, yeah, quiet mind, yeah, yeah, that's good. You know, I've read about that. Mm. Whereas, for me, what was so different about this was that it, it, it's really pointing to truth. And, and I, I, it's funny, I found myself, you know, we were at the conference today and I found myself saying to a, a number of people who were going, well, you know, I, I kind of think I see it here, but I don't see it here. For me, this is either true or it isn't. If it's true, that changes everything. And in my experience, it absolutely is true. If it isn't true, if it's just another set of good ideas, even I'm not that interested. 
Okay. Right? The world's had good ideas for thousands of years. It doesn't need more of mine. Right. Um, what's so surprising to me about this is I, the last thing I expected was to find something that was true. Yeah. Right? I came out of an NLP background where you know, it was all about the most useful lie. And I didn't use that word pejoratively. It's like that's what we were trying to find. It's like given that there is no truth, what's the most useful thing we can make up? And that was, look, it was better than getting stuck in one way of seeing. Yeah. But it left you kind of without much of a compass. And so, yes, you could absolutely reframe things. You could look at them different. You could think better. But then what? Yeah. And, and, and for me, when I first started to glimpse this, and I write about it a bit in the book, and so it went, oh, wait, well-being is the default. Peace is the default. Connection is the default. That really messed me up in a good way. Say more a little bit more about that because how how do you do you know how how did you realize or know that it's a fundamental truth that we are innately healthy and we are, have innate well being? The funny thing is, I'm gonna make up an answer for you, but the answer is I just did. I heard it and I knew it was true. Uh, now I then thought about it, and when I thought about it, I thought, well, gee, babies are innately healthy, are innately well. You know, babies don't need therapy. Yep. Right? And and at some point, you know, even, even my kids when they were younger, you know, you could absolutely see. I tell the story of, you know, Maisie coming into the room and I've got a client and saying, Daddy, you know, can I go play with the fairies? <laughs> you know, and I said, sure. I mean, you know, after all, I'm not an ogre. Right. And, and you know, and, and that, and, and I turned to the client who was desperately kind of going, oh, I'd like to work on, on, on connecting. Can you help me connect? <laughs> and I was going, do you think Maisie needs to work on connecting? And he was like, well, no, but she hasn't learned to cut herself off yet. Right. And see, I think intuitively we do get that we do that, that we're the ones who cut off from source. We're the ones who cut off from each other. We're the ones who, who take the reality of an individuation of a physical self and turn it into, I am separate, and you are separate, and enemy or friend, and, and all that game of life all comes from that fundamental cutting off that we forget that we did, uh -huh. that isn't natural. And I, 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 to me, the distinction between natural and normal is huge. Most of what I'm talking about isn't normal. It's normal to, to hate people. It's normal to feel separate. It's normal to feel isolated and alone and sad and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it isn't the design. It's just one of the things we can do with this amazing gift of thought. Um, and when you see that, you're less inclined to do quite so much of it. Right. I guess that's my experience of it, is that mm -hmm. uh, as you get more and more of an understanding, and it, is, it, it is a journey, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, yeah. you, uh, um, you do tend to uh, see it more, see the thought more for what it is. Yeah. But, but say a little bit more about, um, oh, what were we talking about there? It was really nice. The, the, um, Can I just stop you one sec? Sure. So this is now so it's uh, run out of HD space. Oh, right. Do you need to delete some stuff from it? Yeah, can you just quickly do that? I don't know how you use this thing. So. Mm. Try to delete a couple of things off that. Mm. Lots of beeping on that, I was hearing. Yeah, it's like, it's run out of space. So. That's good. We can edit the beeps. Yeah. <laughs> the magic film. It was like, did you see Shal's picture in the program? Yeah. Why? That is just brilliant. That was hilarious. I said to him, I said, tell me that's fake. And he went, oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Why did he do it though? He, he likes to change things up, he said. <laughs> he doesn't like the, the, the brochure to just look good. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sada was in there and she was saying, well, I wouldn't have married him if he actually looked like that. <laughs> <laughs> there was less, um, is it the Hasidic? How do you, how do you yes, there, 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 in the past there's been a huge yeah, be community nice. from, um, from America, from Milwaukee, from a couple of places, and they're, they're, on the, they're, not, they're not here this time. Is that because of the timing? Cause it's I assume it's just the timing. I don't think there's anything, I, there's no falling out I'm aware of. It's just, you know, it's like, <laughs> we bad Jew. Like, <laughs> we did like where you had the chairs. Yeah. We're not coming. <laughs> no, I think they're actually, they loved it. But, 
cool. Yeah. The name was saying she thought that it's quite nice to have a more mixed audience. Yeah, I think it is. And I also think there's a there's a lightness this year. Mm. Yes. Um, mm. a, a more of a lightness than there's been in years past. It's a, it, and it's it's kind of it's nice. It's nice to speak into because um, there's less of a sense of oh god, okay, here we go again. Um, you know, people just seem to be willing to kind of hang out in it. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that's just more exposure or if that's us or some combination of the above. It's definitely lighter. I think part of it is, I mean, as Julian said, your, your, your book is it's done in such a way that it's not, <laughs> it's not a doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, I love the fact that it was a conversation. Yeah. But it was just, you kind of, you kind of breeze through it and then you go, I've got to go through that again. Yeah. Well, that's what's been so lovely. I mean, I, I really meant that. That I, it didn't even occur to me to say, you know, you might want to come back to this, and yet everyone does. Yeah. Like that's the most common thing that I hear. You know, is oh, you know, well, the second time through or the third time through, and I love that because that's because because that's what you have to do with this something like this. I mean, I have no idea how many times I've read Sid's books. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. but. But it's like I just, you know, every now and again, it's just time to read Sid again. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, when you wrote it, yeah. How how was that? I mean, did you? On I mean, I I know when I when I did my probably on about three or four occasions, it wasn't me writing it, but the rest of the time I was trying to do it. Yeah. Which is why I want to do another one. Yeah. And I want to I don't want to get into more of a space where it wasn't me doing it, where it wasn't me doing yeah. it. But I kind of know that to get into that space, you don't try and do it. Yeah. It's complete. <laughs> so did you find that? Like, because th th none of it, to me, was forced. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, for me, it's a willingness to do a hell of a lot of editing and a hell of a lot more writing than is needed. So it's like, I just write, and sometimes it flows, and sometimes it's shit. <laughs> and I just, I, I know that I, nobody's allowed to read it till I'm ready, so I don't <laughs> censor that. And I just cut away the shit, and what's left is really good, yeah. <laughs> you know. So that I mean, yeah. There's, the, you know, the experience isn't always flow, but you don't have to keep the bits that aren't. Um, you know, that's that's. And I've just always written that way. My first book, the first draft of the first book that I did for Hay House was 125,000 words, oh my and God. the actual book is 62,000 words. Wow. So I cut over half of what I'd written. Wow. This. You know, this was, I think we finished about 29,500, and I had to negotiate that short a book. Like, that was the hardest part of getting a deal done, was getting permission for it to be as short as I wanted it to be. Mm. Um, well, nobody Why did you want it to be a short book? I just find with the principles, less is much, much more. Mm. It's so easy to get into your head about them. That, yeah. That, that, you know, I didn't know what the real length was, like I, I wouldn't have minded if it was longer or shorter, mm. but I didn't want it to have to be a certain length. Um, because, it, you know, it, there just comes a point where it's like you can make it longer, but it won't be better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not in the words anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is what it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, try something else to publish it. So what do you mean it's not in the words? You are writing a book, aren't you? Yeah. Well, well but see, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that my publisher got hit by this when I was teaching ah. in London. So she came to me and said, I want you to write about this. And so I had a lot more leeway. We did we did shop it to some other publishers as well, and they were a little more... The, the one other serious offer we entertained was um, a, a, a slightly bigger, more mainstream publisher, but they wanted, to, they wanted editorial control. And I just thought, that's going to be a nightmare because you're not going to get it. Like you're, you're not gonna. You're, I've had so many experiences like that, even in the first few books of dealing with editors who think they know better. <laughs> and it is partly arrogance, but it's also partly they don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. And and they don't trust my voice to say it. Um, it's know. pretty brave of your publisher to be able to really, you know, take it because yeah. it's you know you're putting a lot of copies and putting it in a lot of places, doing a lot more. And you know, for someone who doesn't get that to then just read it and go, you're crazy. Yeah. To 
Well, like I said, I had the advantage of that the publisher did get it. Um, now, the American one didn't, but the British one did. And, and so, because they no longer do separate editions, I didn't have to deal with that. Ah, okay. So I had my, you know, my crew over here work with me on it. So and then the Americans just had to take it. So it is the same edition, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, which weird is, it looks very different. The American edition looks about half the length. Oh, right. But it's the exact same text. Oh, wow. Um, and I don't even know how they did it. It's got a shiny cover and something like that. I mean, but it's, yeah, the text is identical. Whereas in the past, we've always done British examples, American examples, and broken it up. Here, we just kind of went, <laughs> Every, everyone reads it online anyway, so, you know. <laughs> right, you get to go again. Sorry about that. Where do you want to pick up? Just with a fresh question? or? A yeah, well, he was trying to remember what it was. That's why I thought oh, it was a good time to stop. There was, there was an editor's friend in there anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, you just mentioned something really interesting, which was kind of like, we were talking about the journey mm -hmm. of understanding and moving towards understanding that everything yeah. is, works this way. Tell me about that journey. How was that journey for you, Michael? How oh, was that journey for me? It was, it was mostly lovely and sometimes icky. <laughs> in, in, in that it's not, it's very different because it, it's more like describing a journey down a river than a hiking trip. So it, it, there's, there's not, like in a hiking trip, yes, there's the trail, but it, a lot of it's down to you. And in this, really all that's down to you is staying in the boat. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, ha you do have to stay in the boat. Like You do have to stay in the game. You do have to stay in the conversation. But other than that, it's, it's an unfolding. So, so it's like the wisdom of mind, this deeper intelligence that, that, that's part of our nature, that unfolds it to you. But you do have to keep listening. So in a way, you're absolutely involved in the process, yeah. but there's just nothing to do. And, and that, for a long time, I kept trying to do something with it. Okay. Like, okay, well, how do I get this more? How do I get better at this? Or how, it, it, for the longest time, it, when I was first learning, it was like, well, how do I use this to create the miracles that you guys are creating? And it was, I, you know, I actually went up to uh, Le Connor, spent some time with George and Keith and Linda, and, and I went up absolutely with the intention, I'm going to model what they do, I'm going to NLP it, I'm going to figure out the strategies, the, the underlying beliefs, and I'm going to create the model and teach this therapy, from a, make it accessible to the masses, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and when I came back uh, for, from there, my, my, my friend who's doing NLP with me said, well, did you get it? And I, I, I said, I, I said to him, I, I said, I'm so sorry, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. Because I just had seen something. And I didn't expect there to be anything to see. And that was, that, that's what's so different is, it, it, you know, people ask me now, why do you think this works so well? Why do you think this is so life-changing? And I say, because it's true. And, and you don't even have to be that good at pointing to the truth, because it's really there. As long as somebody looks, they'll see it. Um, and, and, and in a way, our job, those of us who try to have this conversation with other people, is just to keep them in the conversation and keep them looking in that direction. When everything else in life is telling you, no, 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 you need to look at your circumstances. You need to look at your habits. You need to look at your behavior. You need to look at your, your, the specifics of your thinking and change this thought for that thought. And, and to actually just keep going to people, no, no, no. You don't have to look at any of that. Look for what's true. Look for where your experience is coming from. Look for this deeper intelligence, this source. That's going to, look for a feeling. Mm. That's going to carry you. That's going to give you everything that you need. And do those feelings, how do those feelings guide you in that, in that process? Are they the oar in your, uh, are they steering oar in your canoe? Or is there anything, is, is there no steering to do? Well, in, in, in the sense of the unfolding of the learning, I don't think there is any steering to do. You follow your nose, you follow your gut, you follow what interests you. You, you know, your wisdom will guide you on this journey. 
Um, so you could say it's the ore, but I'm not convinced that it isn't also the river. Okay. Um, I just think it. <laughs> you know, way, once you get past the idea that it's your job to figure it out, it's really a relaxing way to learn, because there really isn't anything to do. And I, I no matter how many times I say that, I know because I was I I was there. I was like, okay, so step one, don't do anything. Step two, you know, and then you want to know, well, how do I not do anything? Mm. And and it's and I think the other thing is people get confused when they hear that and they think, oh, so I'm not supposed to do anything. And they sit. And it's, it's not a behavioral injunction. It's, it's actually just a recognition of anything that you do to quiet the mind makes the mind noisy. You know, I, I, use the, I don't actually even know if this analogy is in the book, but I sometimes use the analogy of wisdom being like writing at the bottom of a swimming pool. So it'd be like, the answer to your question is written at the bottom of the swimming pool. Now, if you dive in, to try to find the answer, you're not going to see anything. Right. You actually have to kind of just stand by the pool, let the water settle, and then it's there. In fact, it's magnified by the water. And it's, it's, it's like that. When the mind gets reflective, when the mind gets still, the wisdom's already there. But, you know, trying to do something to quiet the mind is like diving into the swimming pool to, to still the water. Okay. It doesn't work that way. And um, so one of the things I really love about, well, two things that you said that I remember. Really one of them is that uh, and I've seen you talk about this before, and even today I'm getting the same sense from you, is like 100% absolute certainty that mm -hmm. this is the truth. And that sense of trust mm -hmm. seems to me to be hugely powerful. It, 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 I'm tempted to say it's everything. I don't know that I'm right. Like, I don't know that it really is everything. But the trust, I always say to people when they say, well, it sounds like faith. Well, it, it, it's a kind of faith, but it's, it, it's not a blind faith. Like, I have a certain amount of faith that the sun's going to come up in the morning. You could say I have certainty that the sun's going to come up in the morning. Because right. it always has. Now, of course, it's possible one day it won't. Yeah. Well, I've got that same kind of faith that thought creates feeling, because it always does. I've got that same kind of faith that that deeper intelligence is available because it always has been. Now, might one day my thought not create feeling and there not be a deeper wisdom? I suppose it's possible, but I, I, have, I have a certain degree of, of educated faith right. that the sun's gonna come out tomorrow and I will have fresh thought and new ideas and in the meantime, my thoughts will create feelings and I will ride that as best I can. And so uh, we, um, what we're about at Stars of Wellbeing is to get this out to a wider and wider audience, yeah. uh, the stuff that we do. And um, I, you t earlier you said about, you know, to, to get something out to the, to the common man, as yeah. it were, not wishing to be denigrating because they're all great people. And how do you... Well, I, I, we're all the common. Exactly. That's kind of the point. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, but uh, it seems to me at the moment that this is a fairly... Little known thing. I, I was shocked because I had worked, I, I'd managed two bookshops in London, you know, a psychology bookshop and a New Age bookshop. So I, I'd read a lot of what was out there in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. I had studied, probably, I, I honestly think I had read as much or more than almost anybody in the field. And I had never, ever, ever come across this, even with my 20 years or so in the field. And, and so, yeah, they did an amazing job of keeping it a secret. Um, and how easy do you think it's going to be to be accessible to, to everybody in the world? I mean, your book well, does a great job of making it accessible. It's going to be interesting to find out. I think what, what we're up against that, that's real is a culture that continually tells us, and has done for thousands of years, it's not a fault of modern life, yeah. that the world works from the outside in, that our feelings come from our circumstances, and that we're, to differing degrees depending on your culture, either that we're on our own, or there's a judgmental being who decides whether or not you're allowed to have well-being and, and things like that. Right. Um, and then in the last couple hundred years, it's been, well, 
Now, the well-being piece, that's psychology. That's the domain of the mind. And if your mother did this, or your father did this, or you did this, you're up against that. And, you know, the sort of psychological boogeyman. Um, and, and so that's, that's the only thing that we're up against in terms of people are used to thinking of it that way. What we have on our side, our secret weapon, is we're telling the truth. And, and so, all, like I say, it, it, it's a heck of a secret weapon. Because I know that if somebody really looks, they're really going to see it. Because it's there. Right? If I'm, I, I forget who I first heard this analogy from. I think it was Sandy Crop. A great analogy about bird watching. And she said, if, if there's a bird in the tree, and I want you to see it, all I have to do is keep pointing, and at some point it's pretty inevitable you're going to see it. Sure. And, and for me, this is like this. There is a bird in the tree. There is a truth behind the human experience. And if enough of us point to it in enough different ways, people will see it. And it doesn't matter that everyone else is going, there's no bird in the tree. Don't look at that tree. Look over there. It's innocent. I mean, nobody's trying to stop you from looking. But they really don't think there's a bird in the tree. They really think, oh, that's a waste. I looked for that bird once. It's not there. Yep. You know, the blue bird of happiness. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, you know, the best you can get is this. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, even that idea is not new. Plato's cave. Right? That was, that was you know, Socrates' analogy. It was everyone's looking at the shadows and trying to make sense of life based on a reflection, an image. And if they would turn the other way, they would experience freedom. So it's back to that separateness you were talking about earlier. That's, that's the that's the kind of the illusion. I think is what you're what you're saying. Is it, am I putting words in your mouth to, to say that? Yeah, but I like them. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I think there is a oneness to life, from what I can tell, and from what the physicists say, and from what the mystics say. I mean, nobody really disagrees about that. I find that interesting. I used to think that. When I was first learning about this, well, you know, like, this is spiritual. I can only talk to certain people about rice. I found myself to be wrong again and again and again about that. Um, I have I, I have really yet to talk to I've talked to one person, literally, who who couldn't see at least some of this. And and they were so violently against anything that even sounded like it. And I wonder now if maybe I could talk to them about it because I see it more clearly. Okay. You know, so I mean, you know, atheists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jewish people, Muslims, Christians, I mean, Hindus. I mean, I, I've literally, you know, I've taught people personally from over 30 countries and from, I, I've, I, I've not counted religions, but every religion I've come across, including atheism. Um, and, and nobody doesn't except at least at the basic element that we're not in charge, that we're not the, the predominant creative force in the universe. And, and, and just seeing that that actually matters and seeing that thought is the, that, that missing link, that thought is the thing that creates experience, it changes people's lives to see that. Mm. And, and in, in a really gentle way, usually. Sometimes like a slap in your face. But usually, really gently, people just start to feel better. And, and things that seemed like, when I was first learning, I do tell this story in the book. You know, I was experiencing results with clients. And I've been working with NLP for 15 years, yeah. very successful. Yeah. But I was getting results in my private practice I had never dreamt of. And, and I went to one of my mentors and I said, I don't get it. I'm not doing anything. I'm just talking to people about these principles, about the inside-out nature of experience. Why would that make these lifelong problems or 20-year problems disappear? And I loved her answer. She said, because they were never really there in the first place. So it's, it's, it's a different kind of a magic trick to make a shadow disappear than to make an actual solid object disappear. And our problems look like solid objects but they turn out to be shadows. The illusion. The illusion. Cool. Yeah. And, and the other thing that comes out of that for me, and maybe you can talk to this, yeah. is a, there seems to be a, a huge sense of hopefulness mm -hmm. that comes out of 
the prince. Yes. I love, I don't know if you've read the Lord of the Rings books, yeah. but one of the things I love in the Lord of the Rings books is that evil is personified in the books by a loss of hope. So what the forces of evil do is they take away hope. And good, white magic, is giving hope. Yeah. And I think that there is a, a lot of white magic here in the sense that there's something incredibly hopeful about realizing we're part of this infinite potential. We're one thought away from well-being, no matter what we've been through, no matter what we're going through. We're one thought away. That's incredible to me, and it, it makes it a lot easier to sit with somebody who doesn't get it, and who doesn't get it, and who doesn't get it, and say it for the 19th time. It, it makes it easier for me to say, read the book again. Read, read, it, read one of Sid Banks's books again. Because I don't know what's going to trigger it. I mean, to be honest, they might have just as much luck driving behind a beer truck. right? Because what they're going to see is going to come up from inside them. Yep. But when they see it, it's done. That bit's done. And then there's more to see, and then there's more to see. Right, so it's never a kind of... There's never a binary answer, is there? There's kind of, you see it a bit more clearly and then a bit more clearly. Yeah, and sometimes you have these huge leaps in consciousness and you suddenly get a whole bunch of stuff clear. And more often than not, it's like, oh yeah, this bit's a bit, I get this a bit more, I see this a bit more, oh, that was a, that was a cute insight. And then, I, I, you know, I was saying at the conference, I think, you know, the, you get the, the two big ones, which are the, the Charlton Heston, you know, oh my God. In, in, insights, and then you get the, the Homer Simpson, you know. I think it was Keith Blevins who used to call it flathead therapy. Because you're coming in and you're going, oh! You know? and, and, but they're both great. Yeah. You know, I, I, I remember saying in a, in a talk, I think it was last year at the conference, how you can explain all human behavior in, in two phrases. And, and why does anyone do anything? Because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Sure. And, and, for me, what shows that people intuitively sense the truth of, of thought as the, you know, the creative force is, the, is that when you look back and you feel like an idiot for what you were doing, you always say, what was I thinking? And we recognize, yeah, it, it, it seemed real in our thoughts. I mean, that's, I, I don't know, would it be okay if I go into a little bit sure. the, the principles because sure. I just think, you know, if, if, if you haven't read the book yet, then what am I talking about? Uh, a lot of people want to say, yeah. go ahead. Well, for God's sake, go out and get it. Yeah, but, I agree. But in, go you know, watch the book. <laughs> in the meantime, you know, there's, there's really two things. So we talk about three principles. And, and the fundamental principle, there's no real sequence to them. They're kind of all the same, very different, like three different angles on the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But is, is what we call the principle of mind, what I call in the book the God principle. And it's just that there is a universal intelligent energy behind life. That's as far as uh, uh, you need to go with it. You don't need to decide what it is, where it comes from. There is an energy, an unfolding that we are a part of that was working before we showed up and will continue to work after we go. And we can see it in our body. We can see the intelligence behind the body. We can see it in nature, the incredible intelligence behind nature we tend not to notice that it's behind the mind, and it shows up in the mind as wisdom, and we tend not to notice that it's behind all life. I think I could uh, give you some examples of where, for example, we, with my first child, the daughter, yeah. we tried for years to have a child, and then the moment we gave up yeah. was when we conceived her. And to me, that is the, that there's something bigger than me, and I should trust to that some more. Yeah. Looking back on it, this seems obvious. Well, or, or at the very least, you may as well do. Yeah. Because your best efforts you know, have gotten you where you are. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and I think there's a, there's a lot of comfort and peace in being able to, to, to rely on that, to realize that's like an invisible safety net. You really can rely on that. Mm. Um, you know, consciousness, the capacity to experience life, right? We take that as a given. I mean, it seems so, well, of course I can experience life. Well, why? You know, why do we get to experience life? I don't know, but that's a gift. That, that is a, a, a capacity. I talk about it sometimes like the, the developing fluid for film. It's the boiling water that you put the tea bag in. Okay. Um, you know, it's the shining light that you put film in front of. In and of itself, it isn't anything. It's just pure white light. It's just pure, clear water. But as soon as you put something in it, it 
it brings it to life. Mm -hmm. And so what it brings to life is thought. So thought would be the film, thought would be the tea bag, thought would be, you know, whatever it is that comes to life. Yeah. And that's any life experience that you're having is being created from the inside out via these three principles. The energy and the intelligence of life is kind of powering the system. And then thought and consciousness create our experience. And that's it. And it turns out that seeing that is hugely, it's like, it seems like no big deal. Yeah, okay. You know, most people don't really even argue with that. They go, yeah, I see the logic of that. But what they don't see, I mean, I have a test, which I can't, I can't use the language that I would normally use for it. Sure. Um, but I'll, I'll call it the, what, what, what should I translate it to? The, uh, you know, the, the holy freaking mother of God test. <laughs> Let's call it that. Which is that if somebody hears this and doesn't go, holy freaking mother of God, they haven't really got it. Because seeing the logic of it and, 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 and feeling the impact of it are two very different things. There is a logic to it. And I think it's powerful to see the, that there's a logic to it. But when you actually start to glimpse, oh my gosh, it's all made up. I've been making it all up. Right. And then reacting to it as if it's real and trying to fix it as if it's real. And, 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 you know, or I've been trying to do it all myself and I've been trying to work it out. And all the time, the while, there's this, I, I, again, I don't think this analogy made the book, but sometimes he's the analogy of walking along a path with a, with a huge giant behind you. And there's this big boulder blocking the path. So what most of us do is we, you know, we set up using our strength and, and or we'll use our intellect, we'll use leverage. So we'll get a lever and we'll move the rock and we'll manage to move the rock like this much, but just enough. And we squeeze through and we have such a sense of accomplishment and ego and heroism. All we actually needed to do was ask the giant to do that. And that's this incredible resource of mind that's always available to us. But we forget, or we don't know, or we, we, we don't, we haven't made use of it enough. We haven't seen it enough to rely on it. And once we start to rely on it more and more, life gets so much more effortless. Because we're not trying to do things that are being done already. Um, you know, the thought feeling piece. When I start to see, oh my gosh, this is all made up. I, I mean, I remember for me, one of the first ones I saw was I was, um, um, we got invited to a Grammys party. I live, I live in Hollywood. So, and I, I was like, oh, I, I'm shy, you see. I can't believe that. Well, I could, <laughs> right? I did for years and years and years. And I thought it was a real effort. I could get up on stage and prance about, but, but boy, then I needed to go hide, right? Because I was shy. And I, you know, I even said to my publisher after my first book, I said, put any microphone in front of me and I'll talk to it, but I will not go to a book launch party because I'm shy, <laughs> right? Well, it suddenly dawned on me. I'd, I'd been studying the principles. And I thought, it's a funny idea. I wonder, but if I wasn't shy, like surely that's just an idea. That's just thought. And I went to the Grammys party and I had a great time because I wasn't sitting there going to the party fighting against this reality of shyness. And I, you know, and it, was, it was sort of a shock and I started seeing that everywhere. That it's all made up. Now I'm not saying you can go in and will yourself out of it because as long as it looks real to you, if you think, well, I'm really shy, so how do I, what do I need to think to not be shy? It, it wasn't that. It was, I just saw that, well, that's made up. I'm not shy. Sometimes I act shy, sometimes I don't. But once I make up the identity of shy, I then discount all the times where I'm not shy. Right. I don't know what that was. That was a moment. <laughs> really, I mo trust me, I'm shy. I must have had something to drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, yeah, well, that's the other thing we do. We attribute it to something outside ourselves. And yeah. that's, look, that's the only reason I stopped doing techniques with people, is because I saw that even the slightest technique was like, you know, it's, it's like if, if you and I know that our kids can naturally float, right? I'm not saying do this at home, kids, but, you know, we, we might throw them in the, in the pool knowing, you know, we're there, but knowing that they're, they're going to actually rise to the surface. If we put even one thing for them to grab onto in the pool, they're going to grab onto it. Yeah. And that's the problem. If you, if you, if you give people a, 
well, maybe it's this great technique, or maybe it's me. Maybe it's just hanging out with me that lets you feel this good. Maybe it's the drink. Maybe it's the food. Maybe it's the drug. Maybe it's the sex. Maybe it's whatever it is. They will grab onto it. And my, my kids were exactly like what you described. Yeah. My son would just run to the side, yeah. jump in, and start kicking. Yeah. He'd be gone. My daughter would climb down the ladder, yeah. hold onto the side for grim death. The side yeah. was safe. Yeah. And she didn't realize that she'd forgotten that she could float, yeah. naturally float. Yeah, and that's why it's really interesting. They, um, they, certainly in the States, they do, they teach babies to swim because a baby doesn't yet have the thought that they can't. Mm -hmm. And, and they've, you, they've got this amazing videos of these kids under the age of one swimming. Um, and it's, it's actually considered a safety issue that it's, you know, if you can show them that early. Um, I just remember all the other all the other parents around the pool. The moment my son dived in, would be going, ah, "What's he doing?" It's like, "No, he's fine. He'll be he'll be fine." And I think that's that's the other misnomer. Is I think if you and I'm I'm going to assume that a lot of people in stars of well being have spent a, a, a lot of time studying personal development or self help in one form or another. Right. And and one of the things that makes that problematic, and boy, I'm talking from personal experience, is that. It, it really looks like that's helped. Okay, it hasn't helped as much as I'd hoped, it hasn't helped as much as I want, but I'm on to something. And so for, for people like us to come along now and go, actually, that's getting in the way. The idea that you need to remember this, practice this, do this, that's actually what's slowing you down. It, it sounds oxymoronic, and it, it, like, well, that can't be true. I know better. But, but what happens, and it happens every time, is when you do experience a breakthrough, when you do experience a huge insight, it's because you let go of the old thought for a moment. You know, for me, one of the reasons that I studied and practiced NLP for so long, and I learned a lot and had an amazing experience, and I know that a lot of people have been helped by that work, but it came from one insight where I was reading a, a book and it, it said, turn down the volume, on the voice inside your head. And it got quiet. And I felt well-being for the first time in my adult life. I said, you know, I've been a depressed suicidal teen. And because I thought it was the NLP, I threw myself in. I became, you know, a leading trainer, a leading practitioner, because it really looked to me like that's what had done it. Boy, that technique did it. What other techniques can I learn? Okay. What other techniques can I do? Mm -hmm. There's a comedy to me that if, if that happened to me now, and I recognize that that was just my natural state of well-being, I, I don't know what I would have done for those 15 years, but I would have had more free time. <laughs> but do, do you find that, um, so you coming back to your journey, yeah, do you find that there was, you talk about when you let go of the thought, did you have resistance? Did you find it difficult to let go? Because you obviously were very successful, yeah. have been and are a very successful yeah. uh, coach. I, I, honestly, no, because it, it, there wasn't anything left to hold on to. Like, I, I had thinking about it. I mean, I was about to go on a book tour, promoting a book, telling people about how to use their thoughts to create well-being. But... But I just saw, well, it, but it doesn't work that way. And so it, I, 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 I couldn't keep teaching that. It, 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 you know, it's not, it's not harmful, I don't think, that people think that. And I've gotten, you know, look, I know that book has saved lives. I've gotten emails and letters from people. And I also know that that, that idea that I needed to do it that if I didn't take my behavioral Prozac, as I called it, every day, I was two weeks away from black depression and suicide. Oh. Now, I wasn't, funnily enough, I wasn't that worried about it because I knew I wouldn't stop taking it. Right. I, I knew I wouldn't stop practicing. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of wild when I suddenly saw I didn't have to and that there was actually uh, something that would pick me up and I just had never, never let go long enough for it to come into play. I always remember this, this I haven't used this analogy in this context, but um, years ago, me and I have been together 25 years now, and, and in the first few years, we had the usual teething yeah. issues of a couple. And 
One was that I never cleaned, and 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 that I didn't care about the house, and, and I thought she was probably right. You know, I I I wasn't proud of it, but I never seemed to want to clean. You know, and and then she went away for, the, for a few years in for the first time, where she went away for a week, and about three days in, I I kind of noticed myself cleaning the house. I thought, oh, and I just she'd never left it more than a day. So it had never got to the point where it occurred to me that it needed cleaning. Right. Well, in a funny way, it's the same thing. If we've learned to be on our thoughts, on our moods, ooh, okay, what are my moods doing? What, ooh, no, you know, I gotta control it. it. The reason you don't recognize that there's a self-correcting mechanism is because you've never left it alone long enough to self-correct. Um, now that's not everybody's experience, but a lot of people who spent a lot of time in self-help, that's what I see. Um, and they have had maybe a time in their past where they got caught up in thought, and they got depressed, or they got anxious and had anxiety attacks. And they're so worried about that happening again that they've been on it ever since. And, and I wouldn't say to somebody, you know, you should let it go because that sounds irresponsible. But what I can tell you, what I can tell anyone is, as you start to see how this works, as you start to see that it's, you're only ever living in the feeling of your thinking, you will wind up letting it go at some point because it just won't make sense to hang on to it. And it so and different people do it at different, everybody does it differently, different yeah. speeds, different ways. Yeah, I like the analogy, I um, uh, can't remember who had it today, somebody in the conference today used the analogy of popcorn. Huh. That like. The, learning the principles is like applying heat to popcorn. Okay, not every kernel pops at the same. Some pop really early, some pop really late. Some don't pop until you take it off the stove. You know, some don't seem to pop until the next time you put them in. Um, and 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 so it it has its own timing. But if I know that the nature of the kernel is a popped piece of corn, yeah, it's easy to keep going. You know, even if every now and again I go, why won't this one pop? So there's lots of things that I get from what, what you've been saying. I mean, yeah. First of all, I find your uh, you know your your complete trust in in the mm. principles is very disarming and, and really um, encouraging, mm. which is which is which is lovely. And and then that leads to the second thing, which is yeah. which is this wonderful sense of hopeful hopefulness. Mm. Because as you know, you're just yeah. talking about I was I was two weeks, fancy having the threat of I'm always two weeks away from black yeah. depression over you. I think that's a horrible place to be, whereas yeah. whereas now... But see, at the time I was quite proud of it. Mm. Two weeks. It's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, sure. I mean, you know, and that was the thing, is it, it, there was no, there was never any, um, any pretense behind it. I thought that was as good as it could get. I, I, honest to God, if you had told me, you know, the day will come where the idea of you being a depressive will seem funny to you. That wasn't even on the menu, as far as I was concerned. And I think that's one of the things, is that there's a whole lot of stuff that, that's on the menu that we don't know is on the menu. And that's where the hope is. Mm. There's a whole lot. It can be so much easier, so much richer, so much better than you can imagine. And that's incredibly... <laughs> so again, and that's incredibly freeing, isn't it? I mean. The sense of freedom you get from that is enormous. Yeah, and for me, that's the, I would say the key to this understanding is that it's about freedom, not control. So much of what we look to is how can I get more control over my feelings? How can I get more control over my life? How can I get more control over my relationships? This is about freedom. The freedom to, to feel great or feel bad and it be fine. The freedom to have things work your way or not work your way and it to be great. Yeah. And, and freedom, we're so not used to freedom. Right, it's the, it almost seems to be the modern default to be in control, to have a plan, to have goals and all the rest of it. Yeah. And this speaks to yeah. a much more natural... Control is such a poor substitute for freedom. It's better than no control, but it's nothing compared to freedom. And what do you think would tip the balance for people to, to leave their, you know, modern day complex control life which they feel is, you know, they pay the price for it yeah. maybe, but they but they feel is success. 
to moving into this kind of... The, the only thing is insight. Like, the only thing that... Because if you try to will yourself into this understanding, that's just control again. Right. It, it's if, if something that you hear in this interview, right, if something that somebody reads in the book touches them, sparks just a, a glimmer of an insight, that's all it takes. And then if they look deeper, there's more to see. So just just the tiniest movement, and you're on your you're on your way. And you're on your way. And and it, you know, for some people, it's just I don't know why I just feel better after that. You know, I, I already there are people carrying the book around. I say I don't know why, but I just feel better. Well, it isn't the book. It's that what the book is pointing to has allowed their natural well-being to come up to the surface. And uh, like, well, it must be the book. Well, it's not even the book. I mean, the book can be a useful pointer. Right. But what it's pointing to is already there. So people are doing it, but the book can naturally, people do it naturally, yeah. everybody, but the book can give them a, an understanding of the principles, can give Yeah, them. I mean, you know, what I like to, the, the way I like to think of it is what the book is showing is what's already happening that you're probably not noticing. That once you start to notice it, will change your relationship with life. So, the one of the, the big reason for doing this was to yeah. was to promote your book because I thought it was so wonderful that yeah. everybody should know about it. And uh, uh, well, thank you. But that's what that's what yeah. we're here to do. But what else what else can they do with Michael Neal to? Well, uh, so we we we've created a, a an online program to go with the book. It's called Living from the Inside Out. Okay. And so that's uh, okay. a series of video lessons with me where I, t I go into more depth with the ideas in the book. And, and then there's an online community and there's monthly calls with me. So people can do that online. They can find it at, uh, I don't know if we can, do, you want to include links or, or how yeah, you want yeah. to do it. No, there'll be a link, there'll be a link yeah. on the page. But so yeah, so people can do, do that. For people who want to train in this, there's Coaching from the Inside Out, which is a, an online program. And then there's also, you know, if you're really in, come on a retreat. Uh, we, we do Learning How to Thrive retreats three, three times a year. Uh, come on Super Coach Academy if you want to learn to do this work. Um, you know, come work with me. Okay. You know, I do intensives. I work with private clients. I've got a, a fairly full schedule, but you know, if you get on the calendar now, at some point, that day will show up. Okay. Um, well, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Yeah, it's been so, great. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I hope that everybody's going to. Uh, either buy the book or click on the link and start the Inside Out program and really start to make that little bit of difference that's going to take them on a fantastic journey to, to freedom. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now, can I just do a little bit more? Yeah. The, do they mind you told them that I've ensconced them downstairs in Excellent. the kitchen. Lovely. They know where everything is. Perfectly fine. So, so the, the thing that, the thing that I, okay. Just think about this as a so desert island discs time. Yeah. You've met, you, I don't know if you've ever had, had a chance to do it. Yeah. No, I've not done it, but I know. Okay. It. Yeah. So desert island disc is like the five big things mm. for you personally, and if I kind of say in your yeah, you know what I mean? in your journey about, yeah. with with the principles, what do you think were your big moments? And, and the last one I think would be lovely for, for you to say would be about where you think your next step is. Okay. One question. I think the, the the first one was definitely um, the one I write about in the book, where I, I really just got that everyone has a innate well, uh, mental health, innate well being. It sounds like it was a Charlton Heston moment. It was. That was a Charlton Heston. <laughs> that was a holy freaking mother of God. I mean, I literally snorted beer out of my nose. It was. I, I was laughing for ten minutes. It was gorgeous and embarrassing at the same time. Um, I think a second one for me was when I saw that I was trying so hard to figure out mind, thought, and consciousness as concepts because I wanted to know whether or not it was worth my time to agree with them. And, and, and it dawned on me that was silly. And, and when I started to look behind the words, behind the concept of mind to yeah, I do have a sense of there being a larger energy that I'm a part of, a larger intelligent energy. Behind the idea or thought of definition of consciousness too, yeah, I'm aware 
of life. I've got this extraordinary capacity to experience anything. You know, behind the, the notion of thought to the, yeah, there's this creative force and it can, in one minute, life can look so hard and the next minute it can look so easy and then it can look so sad and then it can look so great and all that's changing is thought. And I could, I could see the creative force at work. So that was another big jump when it went from conceptual to, to spiritual, to, to, to tangible. Right. A third one for me, this was huge, was I had a client who uh, was, they were very scared of death, kept them up at night. And I was just learning the principles and, and the only thing I could think of to say to them is, well, you don't have to think about it. If you don't think about it, you won't feel bad. And oddly, that kind of helped, but to me, it felt like a cop out. Right. It's like, yeah, well, it's true, but is that the best we can do? And I went to one of my mentors and I said, you know, what would you do if you had a client who was obsessed with death and it was had anxiety about it? And 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 she said, or I thought she said, well, I tell them they don't have to think about that. And and I, that's what I said. And and then and then I went back to her a couple hours later and I said, you know, there's got to be a better answer. And she said, to what? I said, there's got to be something better than you don't have to think about that. She said, I didn't say that. I said, sure you did. I've got the notebook. I said, well, I get that's what you wrote down. But she said, I said, you don't have to think that. And that wasn't even a Homer Simpson moment. That was a moment where my entire sense of what was real started to dissolve. Because I said, you know what? My thinking is entirely arbitrary. Like, why do I think these things are good and these things are bad? I don't have to think that. Why do I think this is scary and this is fun? I don't have to think that. And I saw just how made up my reality was. And as my world was melting, which was a little scary, I was just <laughs> sitting there for about half an hour watching my concepts of life dissolve. Right. It was like three rocks we're still there in the river. And, you know, the energy of mind, the potential of consciousness, the gift of thought. And those three constants meant I didn't feel the need to hang on to concepts as constants. And, and, and that was huge for me. Um, I think if I've got a fourth that, 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 that comes to mind. I think the fourth for me has been really learning to rely more and more on this intelligent energy of mind. Learning that the difference between wisdom and dogma is everything. Mm. You know, I use the analogy in, in, in one of my, my coaching tips about, you know, there's the burning bush, there's Moses, and there's the stone tablets. Right. And we all are running around trying to find new things to inscribe on our stone tablets. And sometimes we even get them, we have a direct experience of well-being and wisdom. And then we want to go write it down so that we can follow what we wrote down instead of looking back to, well, gee, how can I spend more time on fire with the truth without being consumed by it? How can I spend more time in my well-being and wisdom as opposed to trying to follow what yesterday's wisdom told me today? You know, I like the analogy of, of you know, if you have a glass of milk from 10 years ago, and it was a really fresh glass of milk then, and a glass of milk from yesterday, or a fresh from the cow glass of milk today, which one are you going to drink? Sure, today's. Yeah, and that's the thing, is we, we've somehow learned to follow yesterday's wisdom, which is now a concept or a good idea, instead of staying in that flow of wisdom and realizing, I'll know what to say when I know what to say, I'll know what to do when I know what to do, and until then there's nothing I need to do. Well, then you're going into that fifth one now, you see. <laughs> uh, I think, for me, what's to come, it, it, it would be, I, I think it's just a deepening. I might be wrong, but, but I, I remember I loved in Dzogchen Buddhism. The, it's very different to, to Zen. And I mean, this is, what we're talking about isn't Buddhism, but I just think this is a good analogy. That in... Um, in, in Zen Buddhism, it's, it's like, you know, you sit and you sit and you sit and you sit and you hope one day you suddenly burst into enlightenment. And in Dzogchen Buddhism, they try and give people an experience, a taste of enlightenment as early in the process as possible. The view. 
And then all of Dzogchen from that point forward is increasing the depth, the purity, and the duration of that, that view. And that feels to me very analogous to the principles. Mm -hmm. that, that, that people get a taste, they get a burst of well-being, of clarity, of peace, of, of, of mind. And the reason you continue to study the principles is to increase the depth and the purity and the duration of that of that glimpse. And so I that's all I know for now. Perfect. So there already always sorry there already seems to me to be uh, a huge kind of uh, cert certainty and trust about you that I find you know, yeah. really really powerful. Well, and what's really funny to me is until you pointed that out, I didn't really notice. <laughs> like I, I I hadn't thought of it that way. Okay. It just well, but it's true. <laughs> but but I get I get it. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I think that's really uh, uh, really good here is that. A sense of incredible lightness in you, mm. you know, as a as a human being, yeah. which I think is something that we'd all we'd all love to have. So there yeah. seems to be some really uh, pressing reasons to to uh, you know some really good yeah. reasons to uh, to do this. Well, boy, I wish I, you know, I mean that I would love to have understood this, you know, thirty years ago. But I'll take it. I mean, you know what? I'll, 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 I, I don't think it matters when you get it. Yep. I think that's the thing. You, I mean, I've, I've talked to people in their 80s who suddenly, 86-year-old guy who suddenly got it. And it's like, be better then than never. You know? But why wait? So everybody can get it sooner. Yeah. That's the opportunity. Yeah, well, that's the hope. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank Mike. you. Really good. Pleasure. Excellent. Cool. Good. Yay! One, yeah. you happy with that? One, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Cool. That, that felt like it flowed really nice, I'm sure.